everybody. Welcome to our Cabot Executive and Residence Program uh, for 2018. We have a great program for you, uh, great content. It's a really, a, I think, a unique uh, day that we've got established. Uh, the expertise that we have uh, coming in is unique and uh, very specialized uh, in um, sustainability, which is something that the university is very interested in working on and many business and industries are. So uh, we really have an expert in that area and I'll do that introduction in a little bit. But today wouldn't be possible without the vision of Scott Cabot. Uh, Scott founded the Cabot Executive exec uh, Series really with an endowment uh, to help defray some of our internal costs to put together the day and make it happen for use. And his intent was, and he'll talk more about this, uh, but it was really to bring top-level leaders and executives to campus, uh, to put them in front of our faculty, the community, our students, so that we could learn from them and their experiences and their journeys that they had been on, some of the challenges that they had. And the word adversity is actually in the title today, so we'll probably hear uh, some of the adversity that Denise faced in her journey. So this is an extraordinary day for us to be able to uh, put an executive in front of you and interact with her and learn from her experiences, which are very significant. We're already learning from it. We went to dinner last night, Scott and I and others, uh, my leadership team, and had some conversations uh, with Denise's experience at Subaru, and you'll be hearing a lot about those. And she has really been generous, and Subaru has been generous. You're going to be here about three days, which is uh, very unique for one of our executives. To have that kind of interaction time is pretty special. So. It's a great day. We're very excited about the program. We're glad to see uh, the room filling up uh, and that you're taking advantage of the program. And at this point, what I'd like to do is allow Scott Cabot, who had the vision of this idea. By the way, Scott was a student here in the 1970s. I was a student here in the 1970s, too. We know this is a great institution. That's why we're here. And Scott wanted to invest in UW-Stout. He was uh, the Stout Student Association's president at the time that I was um, here as a student, and I was actually one of Scott's senators. So uh, Scott is truly uh, very interested in leadership. He's, a, he's been a leader uh, in many situations on his own, and he's investing in the development of leadership here at Stout uh, through this endowment that he's created. So I want to give Scott a chance to come up and just talk a little bit about uh, the program and why he founded it and uh, introduce uh, the day to you a little bit. So Scott? Okay, thank you, Bob. Oh, and thank and thank uh, thank you to all of you for being here. Um, first of all, uh, let me do a couple of quick thank yous. Um, I want to thank the uh, South Foundation and the Discovery Center and the Provost Office for the administration and uh, execution of this uh, program over all these years. Special shout out to Rebecca back there. Uh, go and wave, come on, Rebecca. This is, Rebecca's our head wrangler. From, uh, from the Discovery Center who uh, keeps all these moving parts going. So thank you for all of your hard work. Um, I want to take a second and tell you about where this came from. Um, my father would have been 100 this year. Okay? This month was his 100th birthday, and uh, he passed away 35 years ago. Uh, he died pretty young by conventional standards. And uh, he uh, found great satisfaction out of sharing what he had learned as a entrepreneur and business person with others, uh, particularly young people. He loved to share his experience with young people. He also had great respect for Stout. He was very impressed by its special mission, by its faculty, its philosophy of education, and he was very happy with the experience I had here, what it did for me. Coming here changed my life, okay, and set me on my path and I owe a lot of my success to my experience here. So when he passed away, um, I didn't want him lost to history. So I had the idea of synergizing these two things, where we would bring business leaders to a place that he thought highly of to share their experiences. And for the last now 35 years, or 34 years, Denise is our 34th uh, year, uh, he's a, they are actually his surrogates. They're doing what he loved to do, uh, which was to share uh, what they've learned and helpfully make it 
better for those who would follow. And that was a big piece of uh, what gave him a lot of satisfaction and gives me a lot of sas satisfaction to see it continue after all this time. Um, I'm especially excited about our resident this year. I've known Denise for almost 20 years and uh, uh, couldn't be more excited to have her with us. Uh, Dr. Meyer is going to tell you a little bit about what she's done uh, as part of his introduction, but I want to tell you a little bit about who she is. Okay, um, Denise is a strong, smart, insightful manager who knows how to make things happen. Okay, she's also generous and thoughtful and has a big, big heart. Okay, she's going to share with you a lot of great insights on how to affect change in complex systems. Okay, she's done all of this in an incredibly challenging environment of organization dynamics. Okay. I was in the organization dynamic field myself for 20 years, and I'm impressed, a no end, to do this, what she has done in the auto industry, a male-dominated industry, you know, with a Japanese culture, no less. <laughs> okay, uh, this is a thing to do that you're gonna hear about. And if we're smart, we will listen carefully this week and take good notes. <laughs> because um, Denise has great lessons to share with you. And I couldn't be happier to have you here. So Denise, thank you. And thank you to Subaru. It's a wonderful brand. Um, I've been driving those cars myself for 20 years. And uh, uh, they're, they're still going. So uh, again, and thank, thank you for being here. And uh, Bob, I will hand, hand it off to you now. Well, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, one of the things that uh, has always been evident to me, I've been uh, working with Scott for many years, he has an enormous amount of um, investment in UW-Stout in terms of it being his alma mater that he's very proud of and very passionate about. So we're very fortunate to have his support. And we're very fortunate in this case, uh, typically, with the executive, we have a team that goes out and tries to reach out to executives that we think match up well uh, with the program and what we try to do. And in this case, because of his relationship that he's had along over a long many, I think you said 20 years with Denise, um, he actually was instrumental in, in uh, securing Denise's commitment today, which uh, we really appreciate because uh, we have a wonderful program. In your, I'm going to read actually. Um, a lot of what's in the program that you've got there. Uh, but, uh, Denise has an MA in Sustainable Development Policy, uh, and she is the Environmental Partnership Manager at Subaru of America, and is, reorg is recognized as being a leading zero landfill expert. She leads the company's external environmental and sustainability programs, which includes Subaru's initiative to bring zero landfill to the national parks. We talked a lot about that last night. That's fascinating in and of itself as an effort. Uh, during her tenure at Subaru uh, Indiana Automotive, which um, your program calls SIA, um, as a safety and environmental compliance manager, Denise headed up the plant's zero landfill efforts, uh, which was achieved with the, the last waste shipment going to the landfill in May of 2004. Uh, because of her efforts, SIA is one of the most environmentally friendly auto manufacturing facilities in the world. And throughout her time at SIA, this is what impresses me, Denise advised more than 800 corporations on how to implement zero landfill best practices in their respective facilities. That's a lot of consulting work on your part. Uh, but I think it also makes a great statement about Subaru and their willingness uh, of, uh, to have you share your thoughts with other companies and uh, really promote uh, sustainability efforts across the board. Uh, Denise holds professional certifications as a registered environmental manager, or REM, and a certified hazardous materials manager. Uh, her master's thesis laid out the path a company needs to take to achieve zero landfill. So please help me give a warm wel uh, welcome to Denise Coogan today, our Cabot Executive in Residence. Pressure's on now. Good morning. 
Uh, <laughs> thank you all for coming out. I know there's lots of places you could be, and I really appreciate that you're here today to share this. I, I wanted to thank also uh, the Office of the Provost uh, under the direction of Patrick, uh, Dr. Patrick Guilfoyle and also Rebecca Thacker uh, for um, for putting this uh, all together for me and, and your, um, to this visit to your lovely campus. Uh, I would also like to thank Scott Cabot, uh, your generosity as while well. I'm here today. Um, I, I never, uh, you know, I, I didn't meet uh, your parents, uh, Arthur and Francis, but uh, they uh, must have been uh, amazing people. I, and um, they, they have a remarkable son. So, uh, so thank you, thank you for that, Scott. Um, I, and I have consulted in a lot of universities, a, a lot of, around the around the country. We've had a lot of universities that came into the plant to, um, to to learn what we had learned. And I've never seen one that's as good as what you have done here. This is amazing. You should be very proud of yourself uh, because what you've done here, not only in your curriculum and what you do there, but also in what you're doing, what I see around when I walk around the campus, it is amazing. And you should be very proud of yourself. And to be number one in the University of Wisconsin uh, system. Way to go, Blue Devils. <laughs> Way to go. That's amazing. Uh, you should be very proud. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attempt to do the remote here and, and not hit this one button that they say blacks everything out. Uh, <laughs> now that they told me that, that's probably the one I'll hit. But um, I always like to start the presentation with this quote from, Di uh, from uh, Paul Hawken. Uh, he's kind of the, grand, the godfather of sustainability and, and as far as the financial and, uh, part of sustainability. And he, re he writes, the future belongs to those who understand that doing more with less is compassionate, prosperous, and enduring, and thus more intelligent, even competitive. And, and that's kind of what we'll show throughout this presentation is we'll hit on all of these. And um, it's just, it's a beautiful quote, and if you haven't read any of his books, I would suggest, highly suggest reading them. Blessed Unrest is a, is a beautifully written book about sustainability, uh, a really um, amazing uh, gentleman. So where did it all start? So I'm, I'm going to, I'm just kind of, the, the title of this was uh, Success and Adversity. So I wanted to show you what our success was, and we've talked a little bit about, it. Scott mentioned some of the adversities of, of putting this process in, but I wanted to, to start it out. And... Um, so this is the Subaru of Indiana plant in uh, Lafayette, Indiana. Purdue University is usually how I tell people where that's at. They know Purdue University. There's probably a bad word around here, isn't it? No. Is, is, is that okay? <laughs> oh, are they? Oh, very good. Very good. They're good people. Yes. <laughs> Don't boil her up, I guess. I don't know. But, um, but anyway, so the, the, the steel comes in on the east side of the plant as a, in a coil. It goes through the stamping process into the body shop where it's um, welded together. From there, it goes out into the paint process, which is the longest process in, in the plant, back over by conveyors into the trim shop, which is here. I don't think I have a – which is probably a good thing I don't have a pointer because of my handshakes. But, uh, but on this side of the plant uh, where, where it becomes a car, and it's tested, and it goes out the west side of the plant where it becomes um, property of Subaru of America, and it leaves the foreign trade zone that we have there. And um, also on, on property, we have a um, daycare center, a recreation center, a clinic on site, um, five retention ponds. We're also, um, see, I should check my notes here. So um, we're four and a half million square feet under roof, 832 acres. Um, when we started the Zero Landfill Program, we had 3,700 associates. Uh, right now, they're up to 5,700 associates working in there. There's about five to 800 uh, contractors and construction workers that come into the plant every day to work. Um, 2003, we became a National Wildlife Federation Backyard Wildlife Habitat so that we have all the, um, everything you need to, for wildlife to sustain there on the property. And uh, so we're very proud of that. We also have uh, 30 acres of native Indiana prairie on the property. Whenever we disrupt ground now, we, we put it back in with native prairie. Um, let's see, what am I forgetting? Oh, we're also the, the safest auto plant in the industry. Uh, we have the safest record uh, for our employees. The average, uh, in the, the standard for auto industry is 7.5, which means that for every 100 full-time employees, you have 7.5 recordable injuries or injuries bad enough to record. Um, our rate when I left there was 0.81, so orders of magnitude less. We've virtually gotten rid of um, repetitive motion type of injuries. 
Um, and as it's 85% male, 15% female at the plant. Uh, so it's uh, very, very male dominated. Uh, when I became manager in 2006, I was the second woman to become manager there. Uh, Julie, who's a wonderful woman, still works there in charge of all of the um, payroll and uh, insurance and associate services, all that. So um, it was very, uh, it was very interesting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we'll just leave it at that right now. Uh, what was started, so these are a few of the awards. We don't do this for the awards, but it was very nice to be recognized. Uh, we were the, for some of the things we were noted for, we were the first auto assembly plant to be 14,001 certified, 9,001 and 50,001. That is environmental quality and energy uh, international standards. It, it, there's a theme that goes through here. We're very competitive. We like to be the first at things. Uh, the first one to be considered a national wildlife backyard habitat. Uh, 2003, 2006, and 2014, we received uh, the Indiana Governor's uh, Award for Environmental Excellence. Uh, May 4th, 2004, we sent our last load to a landfill. So since that time, uh, I, I put more in a landfill every day uh, from my home than we have from this um, four and a half million square foot facility and 5,700 people. We also, in uh, 2013, we're placed in the top 10 of the Sustainia Awards, which was a global award uh, that was uh, given by uh, Bro, Gr uh, Gro Bruntland and the UN, um, that our program could be implemented anywhere and, and show sustainable results. So it was quite an honor to be recognized by the United Nations for, for that type of work. Um, and also, as, as, as Bob had mentioned, we've, we've met with over 800 companies to share our, our knowledge with them as, as well as our competitors. Because at the end of the day, we all breathe the same air, we all drink the same water, uh, we all live in this closed system, save energy, so we need to, to learn from each other. And we want it to, sh to, sh to share with them what we've done, but also to share our mistakes. Uh, and there were several. <laughs> We won't go into that's another whole presentation <laughs> over some beers, let me tell you. But um, that uh, because we didn't want others to make the same mistakes that we had made. Excuse me. So um, how did it start? Well, it started with dumpster diving. And, and that's me in a, uh, in a dumpster. <laughs> the really funny part was getting me in and out of that dumpster, actually. But, um, but uh, that's kind of how it started. It, actually, it started with a, a request from our parent company, Fuji Heavy Industry, at the time. Uh, they're now called Subaru Corporation. But uh, they asked us, they didn't ask us, they told us. Uh, they said, in five years, you will be zero landfill. And I was listening to the interpreter uh, translate that. And, and I'm sitting there with a smile on my face going, yes. Okay, and then it, then it hit, you know, because there's a little delay, and it was like, it was like, okay, I have no idea how to start, but we're going to do this, and uh, so all roads lead back to a good inventory, no matter what business you're in, that's that's where they lead back to. So we wanted to take an inventory of what we were generating. So where were we generating that waste? How was it generated? Why was it generated? What was happening? And from that, then we figured out what kind of containers do we need to, to put around so we can collect this material properly. Where do we need to put them? Where don't we need to put them? Um, and then we color-coded and standardized everything. I think if you're, if you're colorblind, I'm not really sure what you did. But, um, but if you were, um, but most people, no matter where you were in the plant, you, could, you knew what, what to put where. So it was very, um, a very good way to start it. Uh, what were we dealing with? Everything. You can imagine a facility like that. Everything from cafeteria waste uh, to hazardous waste to plastics, cardboard, paper, um, uh, just steel, um, uh, you, just everything you can possibly think of. We were, we were generating it there at the plant. When we started this process, we were generating 459 pounds of waste for every car that we built. Right now, we're down to 200 pounds uh, per unit. Per, per vehicle, which is huge, because now you're not paying to have it. You're not, first of all, you're not extracting it from the earth. You're not having it pro produced. You're not bringing it in. You're not warehousing it, which is the highest warehouse space is the most expensive real estate in any company. You're not paying to have it handled. You're not paying to get rid of it. So by, by taking that out of the equation, 
was huge, and that, and that's a 50 over 50 percent reduction in the amount of waste that we were generating. That's really the thing that I, I actually am the most proud of to do that. But um, but what we talk about really is our recycling. But that's kind of the very last uh, the last part of it. But um, every year we develop targets to decrease that amount of waste generated every year, and every year. Um, I would think I'm not sure we can reduce it anymore, and, you know, because after a certain point, you think, well, how how low can that number actually be? And I don't really know what that number is because every year we lower it, but every year things change. Now we're making the, the Subaru Ascent there in the built in the facility in Indiana, so that changed how things are made. That changes the amount of waste. That changes everything. So it's a constantly fluid. Um, Target that we're, the, the target always comes down. That hasn't changed, and the things that we that we measure has never changed. We measure the exact same things every year, and but it is always amazing that they find ways to to uh, reduce that waste that we generate. And what was needed? What was needed for this? We needed the support of our upper management for sure. And we also needed the support of our associates. So it's very uh, top-driven, bottom, or top-directed, bottom-driven. So when you when you bring those two forces together, it is amazing what can be accomplished. Um, you also need a little patience. Uh, you need the commitment to do the right thing, even when it's not popular. Because when we started this, the managers. Um, they all said, you know, I'm making a car. I don't care where you put your trash, Denise. I'm making a car, and and I, this isn't part of my, not in my job description. I'm not going to do this. And we slowly brought them around to show them, you know, this is what you need to do, and this is why you need to do it. And we did that by by having those targets, by measuring that, by saying this is what you're generating in your little property part in this plant. This is how much you're generating. This is what you're contributing. And, and you need to do something about that. And they weren't very happy with that. But, um, it, but eventually, when they started to see that their associates were very excited about it, that the top management, their managed, so the middle, the, they were middle management, basically. So the top management was saying, yes, you will do this, and you will like it. And, <laughs> and the associates from underneath are saying, yeah, we do like this, because now we're being heard. We do like this, and, and we kind of forced them into, um, to what we want it done. And you also need a sense of humor because <laughs> there were days uh, that you, you just had to laugh. <laughs> but uh, well, I, some of these I took out. Let's see. Oh, so um, so the, the most frequently asked question when people would come in to the plant, they would say, well, how do you motivate your employees? Well, how do you do that? And, and cattle prods. We actually use cattle prods. And... <laughs> No, I'm joking. We don't use Calprod. We use tasers. No, we, <laughs> we, did, we didn't use tasers. But, um, but I think only in Wisconsin would that joke play. <laughs> because you actually know what a cattle prod is. But, um, but what we did is we listened. We listened to our associates. And no one grows up wanting to spend eight hours a day screwing in the same bolt into a car. They want to do something else, but they're there because of uh, many different reasons. They were just going to be there for a few years, so they got money to go to college, and then the family and the mortgage came, and, and now they're still there 20 years later. They want to be listened to. And if you listen to people and um, listen with your heart, and we, we would go out and we would solicit ideas, and we'd say, you're the ones working with this day in, day out. You're the ones who understand this at a very intimate level much more than I did. I, I, you know, I, I could tell you, I don't know that much about cars, even though I work for a car company. I don't know about torque and, and all that kind of stuff. But, um, but I do know about the waste, and, and I do know the people who do know things about cars. And, and that's what we did. There's, a, there's an old uh, silent movie, Metropolis is the name of the movie, 1928. And in that movie, there's a part that reads, between the minds that plan and the hands that toil, there is a mediator, and that mediator is the heart. And I think that when you, when you look at, when you're, wherever you go in the world, wherever you land, the people you work with, the people that are working for you, listen to them, because they have the ideas, and they want to be listened to. They want to belong to something bigger than themselves. And if you allow that, it is truly amazing how 
quickly and how beautifully an idea can mature. Uh, we had five years to get to zero landfill. We got there in two and a half years. And that was, I never thought that we would be able to do it. I never thought we'd be able to do it sometimes, but I never thought we'd be able to do it that quickly. And, um, but it was by listening to our people and by um, getting their ideas. They are truly the stars of this program. The Subaru Associates are the stars of this program. They make it work. Not only do they make it work in 2004, they continue to make it work today. Excuse me, I'm going to get a sip of water. And then once you, once you have developed that culture, nurture that culture. Continue to, to breed that uh, trust that you have. And, and that's why when we, we talk about having the, the best safety record in the industry, it was because of those relationships that we built. And it was because people could come to us and say, you know, I, this is really, I'm really hurting when I do it this way. Is there something we can do differently? And then we could go back and we could look at what they were doing. But it was building that trust to begin with. And how do, you know, what are the principles? And these are such simple principles. It really is. It's reduce, reuse, recycle. And it's in that order. It's very simple. Reduce the amount of waste you generate, reuse what you can, and recycle what's left over. And, and I have just a few examples of that. I, I don't want to belabor it. But um, reduction is always the, <laughs> this, is, this slide is for my own enjoyment. Reduction is the most bang for your buck. <laughs> I put that in just for me, but uh, <laughs> I guess I just love it. But um, it's uh, yeah, that's that's just the humor. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's relative, but yeah. <laughs> but uh, but people would always ask, so what was that great big project that you had that that reduced your waste by fifty percent and got all either all got all your material recycled? And we said there was not one. There were a thousand little ones that some of it might be a reduction of point zero zero one pound per unit. But there were a couple that I'm going to mention here that were large. And, and when you look at these and you think, wow, why weren't they doing that all along? And we thought that same thing. But one of them was in the stamping shop. And this is the, the blanking line. So the coils of steel that we talked about earlier, they come in, they're, they're put here, and then they're threaded through a big blanking machine, like a big cookie cutter that, that cuts out the approximate size and shape of what we're going to form in the stamping process. And we would get those coils of steel in, and we would thread it through the blanking line, and we'd cut out, say, 100 hoods. And then there'd be whatever left would thread back through, and then that would all go out of scrap. And one of our associates said, well, why don't we just more closely approximate that size of the coil to the run that we're making, and then we won't have as much to, to throw away. And it was like, duh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So why don't we do that? And it was just one of those things that we had just never done. And so that w it costs nothing to implement that program. And we save 102 pounds of steel for every car that we build. Uh, and that's been for, for the last seven years we've done that. And today, all the cars that they stamp out today, we still save that much. It's a very sustainable project. Didn't cost anything. Was the right thing to do. Now we're not extracting that steel and, and generating it and shipping it and, and all that. So it's, and that was a, um, a huge uh, savings to the company. Steel is very expensive and, and now even more than ever. But um, so that was one of our big projects. The other one, if you can't uh, you reduce it, which is the most bang for your buck, <laughs> going back to that one, oh, um, you can, uh, oopsie, did I not, it didn't get in there. Oh, so, well, I'll tell you, I'll just talk about it. Um, so another project that we had for reuse, if you can reduce it, reuse it. And so we would send, we would get uh, engine parts in from Japan every day. They would come in the, on this, on the, in the crates, and they were in these four by four metal pallets built up. And they had all the engine parts in there with styrofoam, plastic, and cardboard because they were coming on ocean liners. They didn't want to jostle them around on, on the waters. And we would take those metal crates and we'd bust them back down. They would be put back onto the sea, uh, to the containers, and be sent back to Japan. They'd build them back up. They'd put more of that stuff in there, and they'd ship more parts to us. And that happened for years and years and years. We would do that. And one of our associates said, well, instead of trying to recycle all the styrofoam here, which is a good way to go broke because you're just shipping air when you're shipping styrofoam, um, why don't we send it back to Japan, leave a few of these crates built up, put the styrofoam back in, send it back to Japan, and they can reuse it. And we thought, that's a great idea. So we studied that. 
and we put a little sticker on each piece of the styrofoam. It's very high tech. We're really high tech. <laughs> we're, we're a small car company, so you got to do things cheap, you know. So we put this little sticker on the on the styrofoam, and every time we sent it to, to Japan, we would put a little tick mark on it. And we thought we'll get five trips out of this and then we'll have to recycle it. And so we got the five trips out, the styrofoam was still good, so we went the other way and we started ticking across. We got 10, we got 15, we got 25. Some of them are 27 trips back and forth to Japan using, um, using that styrofoam over and over. Petroleum-based product that we don't have to make from, from scratch. Um, and we save $1.3 million a year. After all the costs are involved, we had to hire a couple people, buy another forklift, all those costs, and then the shipping of it, which is minimal. Uh, still save $1.3 million a year on, on returning that material to Japan for reuse. Then we, then we have um, recycling. So these are just three commodities that we recycle, steel, wood, and cardboard. So if we would have had to take these tonnage, the seven, almost 18,000 tons of, uh, of steel, uh, 1,300 tons of cardboard, and 864 tons of wood, if we had to take and make that again, from virgin material, uh, or how else would be a better way to say it? Uh, so the recycling of this packaging and raw material avoid the manufacturing disposal, thereby conserving 27,500 mature trees, uh, 69 million gallons of uh, or kilowatt hours of electricity, 43,000 cubic yards of um, landfill space, 631,000 gallons of oil, 33,000 basically uh, gallons of gasoline, enough to drive a Subaru. 915,600 miles, so it would just be broke in. Yes. <laughs> and 9 million gallons of water. So when we were trying to tell our associates, this is what you've done this year, I can't, I can't fathom what 17,000 tons of steel look like. I don't know how many Olympic size swimming pools that is. I don't know. So this was a good way because I know, I know what uh, 8,521 homes look like. That was my hometown. So that was enough electricity to run my hometown for a year. So that I can fathom, that I can imagine. And when you let people know that this is what your work has done, this is how you have affected the environment. Your, they, their part might have just been putting their plastic cap into the, into the container properly and, as they were taking it off the end of the air conditioner line or whatever it was. But they had a difference, they made a difference, and they take a great deal of pride in what they do for the environment there at SIA. And, and when you can get a bunch of, um, people who's, who's, that's not their job, is not to, their job is to build the car. It's not to, uh, to worry about the environment. When you can get all those people together pulling in the same direction, that's why we got, that's why we have the success that we have. Let's see what else have I got here. Oh, there it was. <laughs> anyway. Um, oh, so we started from the very beginning with environmental accounting and because we wanted to, um, we want it to justify our existence. Because when you're in the compliance section of any manufacturing facility, as I have for the last 30 some years, you're a drain to the bottom line. Because you're not, you're not really doing anything for the, for the product. You know, you're just taking money from the bottom line, basically. And it always kind of upset me because I figured that I, I was giving something to the company, but it just couldn't really be monetized. So I decided we would start doing the uh, environmental accounting very early on. And so we have all the costs. So you can imagine all the bean, the bean counters have all, every cost of that program. And then we said, what were the benefits of it? What were we actually money coming back into our coffer? So not how much we were saving on the reduction process, uh, pro, uh, projects, but actual money coming back in. Over the last 10 years, we've had a million and a half dollar benefit over the cost of our program every year. So huge savings. Because, and you know, I think back in the 70s when it started, it was very, the Environmental Protection Act was started, it was f framed very well in that it costs too much to be environmentally friendly. If, you're, if you are being environmentally friendly in your corporation, you're costing this company money and we can't have that. And, and that's what I faced when I started because I, I would go and I would learn about the environmental regulations and, and they would tell you the loopholes to get to be able to get out of of doing the things that you need to do right. We never, I never used the loopholes. And then that was a great part about the environmental. No one really understood it. So I could go back to the plant and the plant my operations manager would go, okay, well, if you say so, we have to do it that way. So yeah, 
sorry. And uh, so they never really knew. But, but we never, um, it was one of those things where we weren't costing the company money either. And as you can see, not thinking about your effect on the environment is very expensive. Because when you can save this kind of money in just uh, recycling and, and, and doing the right thing, it's, um, it's a very powerful thing to show people. And there was, in those companies that came in, all the people that came in from that, they didn't come in, some of them, most of them came in because they didn't believe it, <laughs> but that was okay. But uh, a lot of them came in wanting to see how we did it. And some of them came in thinking, this will never work. And when, you got, when I got to the point about how much it saved us, a lot of them perked up at that point saying, oh, ooh, well, okay. You are saving money. Maybe I will look at this. And, and so that was, it's a very powerful thing to have uh, in our back pocket to say, yeah, we do, we do earn money with this. Um, so, and this is just a little bit of, of how we nurtured that culture. This is Kaizen, which is a Japanese term for continuous improvement. Uh, these are all around the plant. These are Kaizen points. These are um, places where associates have come up with ideas. We put those ideas out. Um, so that they can, um, they can see what they've done. So they see their work on display. Um, associate teamwork, working together. Um, the body shop, um, it used to be that you would, statistically we would take so many cars off the line every, every day and we would take them back to the destruct room, which is exactly what it was. We would destruct the car. We would take air hammers and chisels and, and break the welds apart and then look at the inside of the weld to make sure it was a good weld before we, we let those cars go out to our customer. And the people in the body shop, which is what you see up here where they're welding, they said, why don't we use some ultrasonic technology? We can get a quantitative amount of that weld. We can then uh, take that car, put it back onto the line, it can be finished off, and we're not throwing away those th several thousand um, pounds of steel every day. So it was a wonderful um, idea. We had to work with uh, different, different teams to make that happen. So there, um, is, is there, is there, am I doing this with my, do you see it here buzzing? Maybe it's me. Yeah, it's, it's just, oh, the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> At home, it's my uh, smoke detector that goes off when it's ready. But you know, this is good too. Um, so, so motivate uh, motivate management through measurement. So, and we talked about that a little earlier. Measuring what we're doing, keeping track uh, financially what we're doing. But so every manager is held accountable for his section, for how much waste he generates in that section, and he ha it has made him, it has forced him to listen to his associates to figure out ways to reduce it because he will come in every month to a meeting and he will have to uh, explain to the president and vice presidents and all the officers there why he is not making his target. And, and, it, and it's not a fun meeting when that happens. When you have to be the one saying you're not doing what everyone else seems to be able to do, it becomes very, um, uh, very hurtful. And so then they be, that's also very motivating for the managers to want to, uh, to do that. And, because, and you, don't, you don't want to be the woman who's given them a target that's not achievable either. So you want to, uh, that was part of, how do you make that target so it's achievable yet um, not so easy that they don't have to try. So there was a fine line in getting that uh, done. But we used all this measurements uh, to, to be able to do that. Um, section environmental targets uh, boards in every section so that the associates can go by there every day, see what is my mission, what are our targets, where are we in those targets uh, month, month to date, and, and what, are the, on this, what are the ideas that we've come up with to make sure that we reach those targets. So everyone's informed. It doesn't matter if you're the janitor or uh, the, the CEO, you know what's going on at a glance. This was our top management safety meeting. This was all the uh, executives would come out once a week and we'd go to a different section every week and they would, um, the associates then were allowed to, to present their ideas to the president and, and that's Basically, we never paid out money for these. We never gave a lot of big gifts for these. Uh, it was just the, the pride of being able to, to say this was my idea, it was implemented, and I got to tell it to the president, which was a big deal. Um, that's our Tom Easter, that's our executive vice president right there. I don't think you can see our president's kind of behind one of those guys there, but, um, but that's what we would do every week. And I think that really is what uh, separated us from the herd because it really did show all the associates that our executives are behind this. 
that's kind of the plant. So we took what we, we learned at the plant, and in 2016, when the National Park Service celebrated their 100th anniversary, we, wanted to, we were a premier partner, which meant that we wrote a really big check <laughs> to the Park Service, or the Park Foundation, actually, so that they could celebrate their 100th year. And we wanted to do more than just be that company that wrote the check. We wanted to give them something that, that could sustain them for another 100 years. So we had this knowledge that we had given to a lot of different companies. How can it work in the National Park Service? And so that's what we have started, embarked on now, and that's what I do um, now for, out of New Jersey. So um, that's what, uh, give you a little bit of update of what we're doing here with the National Park Service. But there's a, I think I hit it another time. This is a short video. We have fallen heirs to the most glorious heritage a people ever received. And each of us must do his part if we wish to show that the nation is worthy of its good fortune. Theodore Roosevelt. When President Roosevelt set aside millions of acres of land to be preserved forever, he did so knowing these were places of immeasurable value to humanity places of unequaled beauty that people all over the world would flock to. But this popularity comes at a cost few of us ever think about. Trash. Each year, visitors to our national parks create over 100 million pounds of garbage. Garbage that ends up in our nation's landfills. Fortunately, we can do something about it. This year, Subaru, together with the National Park Service and the National Parks Conservation Association, will work toward the goal of making these incredible places zero landfill. Starting with Yosemite, Grand Teton, and Denali, we'll leverage Subaru's zero landfill expertise to help make garbage there a thing of the past. It won't be easy, but like President Roosevelt, we understand this is something we must do for those generations yet to come. Back on. So that uh, video was uh, put together for us from by Carmichael Lynch, just right about an hour from here in Minneapolis, our, our advertising agency of record. Uh, but it's, it's, it does kind of speak nicely to what the problem is in the national parks. We're loving them to death. And uh, so, as I, as I said earlier, um, I think I've, I jumped ahead of myself here, but we took the principles that we learned at the, at the plant and we're implementing them in the national parks and we're also uh, uh, giving them grant, grant fund, fund, funding to help with the infrastructure, with hiring people, with labeling, with marketing, all that, that needs to happen for, uh, for that. And we also did a, a really nice study using uh, Leave No Trace Ethics Organization and Penn State did a nice study on behavior, uh, people's behavior when they go to the parks. And 95% and of the people who go to parks want to recycle properly. They just didn't have what was needed to be able to do it properly. So that's why the, the containers and the labeling and all that went in to the parks. That was one of the first things we did. Um, I will say that, that the project is working, uh, thankfully for my, because I'm not old enough to retire yet, but, uh, but, uh, but it is working. So when we look at the number of people visiting those parks and the amount of waste per visitor, that, that number is going down and the recycling number is going up. So we're getting the benefit that we want from it, uh, not as quickly as we wanted it, but we are getting that benefit. Um, the problem? the national parks, um, over 100 million pounds of trash, uh, and that does not even include the concessionaire waste. So the concessionaires own all the hotels, all the uh, restaurants, all the souvenir shops. If we were to include that money, it's probably three times, or that amount of waste, it's three times the amount of waste than what the National Park Service collects. So we started with three pilot parks, Denali, Grand Teton, and Yosemite, and we have combined the concessionaires' waste in with that, uh, about 16.6 .6 million pounds of waste in 2014 in those three parks. 
uh, that's enough ways to fill the Washington Monument 62 times. So it's, it's a huge amount of, and, and it's one of those things when you go to the parks, you never see it because they're very good at, at getting it out of the way. They have to in, in many, because of the animals. They, you know, you don't want the bears and, and all the other animals to be getting into that. So they have to move it quickly away and you, ne you never see it. So you, it's not a problem when you don't see it, you know. But um, so these were the three pilot parks. Very hard to get a picture of Denali when it's not snowing. <laughs> But uh, those are, that's, that's it's a famous uh, bear, 399. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of 399. It's its number, it's collar number. But she's, um, she's you see her a lot if you go to Grand Teton, and that was her cub that year. Uh, some of the common tasks that we did, so the baseline waste characterization, just like we did at the plant. We got that waste uh, characterization, that inventory of what was being generated, where, why, how. We improved the infrastructure. Uh, we formed community committees. So we went out to the communities because in these areas, the park is the, the engine of um, making money for those, for those areas. So we had to involve everyone in that. Um, also worked with uh, Recycle Across America, which is again over in Minneapolis, an organization who is working to standardize all the recycling labels that you see so that no matter where you are, you can see the same thing and, and you know what to put, you know, oh, my plastic bottle goes there. Um, also working with local and national stakeholders that, that take things into the parks, U.S. Foods, Cisco, those types of companies. Can we use recycling, uh, reusable containers instead of cardboard? Working at those type of things, trying to get that waste stopped from even going into the parks to begin with. And then, of course, um, employee engagement programs in the parks. Uh, it's been, the park's very hierarchical, so it's very much top-down driven. So if we can get the ideas from the bottom up, we'll see a big difference in, in how they, they run those programs. So how can you help? So this is my, my plea to everyone who goes to state or national parks. So if every one of the 331 million visitors that went to the national parks um, last year, had they just taken their, re their bottle, their uh, reusable bottle, a coffee mug, and a reusable bag, we could have saved, uh, we could have reduced the amount of waste per visitor from 20 ounces down to about five ounces per visitor, saving about 310 million pounds of waste. That's enough to fill the Washington Monument 1,122 times. So just those three simple things, and your, your visit hasn't been impacted in any way at all because you're still getting that same visitor uh, experience, but you're not generating all the waste that then that park has to get rid of in some ways. And their budgets keep shrinking, and it's not going to um, get any better anytime soon, unfortunately. Um, See, I think this next one, um, this, that's actually Molokai. That's not, uh, actually, on the other side of the island is, well, actually, on this side of the island is the uh, leper colony on Molokai, but it's a, which is a national park. But, um, but I, I, I never give up on your dreams, especially when people say it's impossible to do it. And I've had no less than nine people on this park project tell me we can't do this. This is not possible in national parks. And, and we can do this. And whether you say you can or you can't, you're right. And, and if we say we can, we can make this happen. And, and I think that's probably the thing that I would impart to the students especially, never give up. Because um, it's amazing when you share your dreams, how big they can become and how much better they can become. But uh, that's, I think, all I had. There was my contact information if you need to, to contact me, but that's all I had. I think we take questions now, I think. If we have questions, if anyone have any questions or? Don't be shy. I know, and usually I go way over because I'll talk trash all day. <laughs> I knew I had to get that line in. <laughs> yes, sir. I think we have a, do we have a mic for him? Okay. Oh, Denise has, oh, there she is. The other Denise. <laughs> Are we on? Yeah, how good. Uh, oh. Thank you. Um, oh, thank you. I, I think all of your efforts are, are commendable and uh, amazing at, at Subaru. I, I think uh, that we all can greatly appreciate the amount of work uh, that this is. Uh, Chuck Bomar, Dean of the STEM College, Science, oh, Technology, oh, Engineering, Mathematics, Management. Oh, great. Um, and I'm, I'm very pleased to see all of this. I, it's very exciting to me. So we see that Subaru has spent a lot of time working on stuff going in the plant. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> 
What thought, knowing that a Subaru is likely to last for not quite ever, but nearly ever, mm -hmm. um, what thoughts have gone into things like design for deconstruction once yeah. the car is done? Yeah, that's, so that's an excellent question. At the end of the life of that vehicle, what happens to all that material in there? And that's, Japan is working, Fuji Heavy, or Subaru Corporation is working on that and have been for many years as to what, what can we do with all that material. And at the plant, the majority of what we put in that car can be recycled. The, the, one of the exceptions is the, um, the headliner, because you have the carpet on the one side and it's like a fiberglass on the other side. So how do we look at those types of things? What can, how can we design for sustainability so that when we're making these cars at the end of the life of the vehicle, what, what can we take and put back into the car? And, and that's kind of what we're looking at right now. Uh, it's a very slow process unfortunately. Uh, but looking at that circular economy uh, as to what happens, you know, younger people don't want to buy cars. They're, they're not wanting to buy cars with much to our chagrin because we want to sell them. But, uh, but what do we do in 20 years from now so to make this a more circular type of industry? So do we just take parts of the car off and replace parts and, and we keep the, the, the biggest part of the heaviest part of the car there and just change that part. I mean, so there's all kinds of thoughts that are going on now as to what, what would that look like. But, how, but now, today, in Japan, if you, if you buy a Subaru, you pay a cost, and then at the end of the life of that vehicle, then they, they get rid of it, they recycle it. So I think that would be nice to have here so that we can get some of those costs of that recycling uh, covered, that we, we've kind of externalized all those costs. But, but as far as the parts in those cars, the plastic is a, they're a good olefin plastic, so they're really that type of plastic recyclers really love. Um, the metals and steels can all, the fluids can be recycled. If you take those out, can be reused at least or, or cleaned and reused. Uh, so there's really a lot that, that we're doing that can, we've gotten rid of the, um, a lot of the, the, the uh, European Union, the hexavalent chromium, the cadmium, uh, lead, mercury, reduce those down to the point where they're almost non-existent so that when we do get rid of that car, we don't have those persistently bioaccumulative chemicals to have to worry about. So, yeah, looking at all those. Does that answer it or? Okay. <laughs> Anything else? I was wondering, of those 800 companies you've oh. trained, have any of them made it to zero they landfill? Actually, they actually have. There have been a few. So um, we don't usually like to, to sh shout out who they were, but uh, but I will. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, uh, Coors is one of them that we met with, uh, Freightliner, uh, GE uh, Locomotives, uh, Burt's Bees. Uh, I'm trying to th now I'm drawing a blank, but there has been quite a few. And the ones who didn't quite make it to zero, they are working towards their environmental management system and, and putting in things that, that are helping it. So, so uh, some companies, it's a little more difficult. We met with the, um, the duck uh, farm in Indiana. We, Indiana is the biggest producer of duck in uh, the United States, who knew? And uh, so they have to be known for something, it's ducks. But uh, so, so that process, you know, they're, they're doing, so the, the feathers are reused, the, uh, the meal that's produced is put into dog meal, they put in another whole um, process onto their plant to, to take that to make it into dog food. So I mean, those types of things are a little harder to get rid of, but they're working to do it, so yeah. So some obscure companies too. <laughs> Any other? Yes, ma'am. You had one. Here, I'll just give you this one. Here we go. So I'm, I'm wondering what sort of um, impacts maybe Subaru has had since 2004 related to um, recycling outside of Subaru, right? So some of the things that we, we discussed in, in my industry is we would like to recycle in my industry but find issues of trying to like locations to recycle. Where do they take the products? So what changes have you seen in advancements of taking those products since 2004? And what are you seeing that there's still challenges for recycling? That's a great question. There, um, there has been a lot of changes, and especially just recently when China has, has kind of stopped the plastics recycling from going over there, that's, that's hurt a lot. 
but in some respect, I think it'll be better for us in the long run because it'll force us then to to make that infrastructure here in this country. Uh, we're very lucky in the Midwest in that a lot of the recyclers are right here through this through this ban from Michigan, Wisconsin, Indiana, uh, down a little farther. So we do have um, we do have that advantage. Not like being in the West Coast where everything has to be shipped to the East then to to be recycled. But it it is more difficult now with with China not taking the plastics. Um, I think looking at what at what we're generating and ch and changing it, you know, so that it can be something that can be recycled. The simple things that we did at the very beginning were we couldn't recycle blue shrink wrap, but we could recycle clear shrink wrap. So now we went to our our suppliers and we said we just want clear shrink wrap. We want we don't want the black ties around the pallets. We want the green tie around the pallet because we can recycle that. So getting back to the supplier to say, look, you're, you're part of this process, so we need you to help help us with our with our goals. And, and, and we did that to all of our suppliers. We went back to all of them and said 86% uh, of our suppliers are ISO 14001 certified. Some of them aren't because it's a very expensive process and some of them weren't, but they have environmental management systems that, that they've put into place to help with that. But um, but doing that and saying, you know, don't send us all this cardboard and don't send us all this redundant packaging. Get rid of some of that. So looking at that can really help. And again, it's reducing that. But yeah, you're right. The plastic in the recycling industry. I think when we started out as single, str when we started out source separated, it was the way to go. And then we got lazy and we put everything together, and that we introduced labor into the process. And when we introduced that labor into the process, it really slowed things down. And I think the idea was for companies to, to uh, automate all that so that we would use air and water and all kinds of things to blow the stuff and separate it out as it went down the line. But that's very expensive. And the prices, I, I never understood when they started because you're not getting much for this. I mean, the styrofoam, we were lucky to break even with the styrofoam because the transportation cost would be just what you're getting back. And if we could break even, that was a good thing. If you can make a little bit, that's an excellent thing. So, you know, reducing it, of course, is always the best way. But then, you know, getting with these waste companies and, and these companies that are doing this to say, look, this is what we want to do. And companies, you know, some of the water bottles and things like that, uh, they want those plastic bottles back. They the, they just can't seem to get them back. Yeah. Any other? Yes, sir. I'll, I'll just yell. Okay. Um, so <laughs> You're used to manufacturing. Other, you can yell. Maybe not so much for Subaru, but in your consulting, mm -hmm. how do how do companies usually go about selecting a location? Because um, I feel I feel like maybe there's you know some locations that are better, easier, more publicity. Uh, like how do they select those locations? Yeah, you know, I'm not sure how they selected those parks. That was that was done before I got into it, um, but they're all iconic parks. They're all Western parks, and yeah, you're right. Yosemite has about five million visitors a year. The, uh, you know, Denali about six hundred thousand, and all within about 120 days. And then Grand Teton is pretty much all year long because they have the ski industry out there too. But um, but not in the park proper, but in that area. But but and the, the first one, how do we select where we send our recycling or how we? Uh, no, when you're consulting with other companies on oh. how do how do you go how do they go about selecting a facility that they want to target? For oh, waste? I like think that they had, you know, it was a lot of it. It was about so say um, they have. 15 facilities across the United States, which one did they want to target first to, to trial it in? A lot of it was based on the, uh, the management of a, of a certain facility. There was a manager who wanted to take it on, who wanted to take it up. Lots of it was, you know, it was a directive from the corporation to, to do this, but they didn't know how to get it started. And they thought this is a good facility because it's in a good place. They have, you know, a good teamwork there. And that's basically how they, they would decide that was the company to, or that was a uh, one part to start with, yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I think that mm. Yeah, there is. I do. I do think that people think that oh, it's my one plastic bottle. It's not going to make a difference in the big scheme of things. And but then by communicating that back to say to the people who and like that you're doing here at the university, you know, explaining 
this is what we've done and this is how it's changed things. So we do the same thing at the plant. Here's here's the amount of plastic we've we've recycled this year and this is what has changed. That you know, it's enough plastic to to you know and, or enough recycling to help power uh, you know 8,500 homes for a year. So being able to tell people that it does make a difference. And, and even the visitors to the National Park, they, they're not thinking when they're coming to the National Park, oh, I need to take my water bottle because I can help save. But if all 311 million, so we don't have to do, you know, we don't have to live in grass huts and eat, you know, nuts and bark to make a difference for the environment. Uh, <laughs> wild hickory nuts, that's an old commercial. But um, you, can, you can make a big difference in, in little things, you know, when, when it's such a huge mass of, of people doing it. And you, you have that economy of scale, you know, like, like it, Walmart or McDonald's do one little thing, it changes things drastically because they're huge, you know. So if, if we can, you know, just those little things can make a big difference. And if and everyone pulling together, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi. You want this? We're sure. close. We'll do that. Okay. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Uh, so, Glendalee Rodriguez, I'm the Associate Provost, and it's great to meet you. Thank you. So, I guess I want to take this a little bit different to just a slant about um, your leadership style and if you can talk to the point of, so any, any advice you have, right, and also as a woman in, in a male-dominated industry. So, can you can you talk on those topics a little bit for, for anyone who, who might be wondering how, you know, what do you attribute your success to? Uh, I attribute it to a lot of gin. Be, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, is um, you know I think I think that's why I ordered gin last night. It's, it's, <laughs> no, I think it is about showing people what's in it for them. You know, showing them that they can be part of something bigger, that they can uh, they can help. You know that yeah we are buying a we are building a car in this facility and that's that is what we're all here for that's what we're in, in Subaru of America that's why we're in New Jersey we're here to sell cars that is our core business but what can we do along with that you know and I think that's kind of um, kind of I don't know if I have a style except that I'm very easy going to a point <laughs> but, uh, but I think really listening to people I think was is kind of the the heart of it all listening to the managers because they would come to me and they would say um, in very colorful language uh, that you know th this isn't my waste he put I saw his people putting waste over here and this is his waste and now you're charging me for this and this isn't mine and and by God I'm not gonna be banned you know, and and you'd go through all that but you'd listen to what his concerns were and um, and then you would try to figure out a way to mitigate those concerns and, and to make him feel better about what it was that he was complaining about and or had legitimate complaints and maybe I, I just didn't understand the whole picture I didn't understand that that's was happening and I needed to change it so I really listening to people I don't I don't think you can stress that enough and I think that and and the other thing is being able to say I don't know was huge for me because I think we get to a certain point in an organization and and you're paid to know all the answers we think you know we think that well you know I should know the answer because I you know I'm getting paid this I should know what the, the answer is but you can't know all the answers and and so to be able to say I don't know can you help me that for me was this huge relief to be able to to say that and and not be afraid to say it and, and to know that there's other people who wanted to help. And I think that's sharing that dream. You know, when you can share that dream and that idea, whatever that idea is, share it with other people and see how big it becomes. When you, it's, it's, I think it's amazing. Someone said it's, when you, it's amazing what can be accomplished when you're not worried about who gets the credit. And, and when you can do that and, and be open and honest and heartfelt, then I think that's really, how things can be changed quickly. Not, not, well, not as quickly as I'd like sometimes, but, uh, but at least changed. Yes. Hello, Denise. Yes. Oh, right here. You mentioned economy of scale, and that's something that was bouncing around my head as you were talking. Is, is Subaru isn't the biggest car maker on the oh. block, um, but have you seen, I think you touched on a little bit, your competitors, have you pushed them morally or competitively from a dollar cents um, to move them? Because 
some of the big animals on the block, a GM or a Toyota, that's where the economy of scale, and especially in recycling, is developing those markets. Right. We did. Uh, we met with our competitors for this. We, we meet uh, every year on the safety side of the world to uh, to, to con- uh, challenge them to become better on the safety side. But from the environmental side, we did meet with all of our competitors. We did not meet with uh, Ford and GM, but we did meet with Chrysler. Um, just because it's kind of a Japanese thing, they didn't want to. But uh, we did uh, Honda, Toyota, Mercedes, uh, all of those. We that, that we call the transplant companies that end up here in this country from another country.